actually, maybe the other side. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Okay. Should we use ourselves? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll just I might sit down. <laughs> so I'm in the frame. Um, cool. Hi, I'm Gab. Um, me and Enzo Hi. are going to run you through assignment one. Uh, let us know if you can hear us okay. Um, and as we go, feel free to post questions in the chat, of course. <laughs> Amazing. Sweet. Um, cool. So assignment one is based on uh, the Frogger game. So actually, let's start off. This is the spec. Um, you can find the link to it up the top, just up here. Same as assignment zero, but it just now links to assignment one. Um, so this is based on the Frogger game from, I don't know if that opened. Yeah, there we go. So you can have a play with this to familiarize yourself. It's a little bit different, but it's fun and a really great use of time. <laughs> yeah, do this in your labs. Do this in your labs. Um, you can do this in the lectures as well. Uh, <laughs> Not in the lectures! Um, so it's a similar thing. Um, in the assignment you have turtles and logs. Nice. Yay! Except in this game you have to do it three times. And you can also die. So, you know, a fun little way to introduce yourself to the game. If you want to have a go. There we go. Cool. So, yeah, have a play through that and sort of familiarise yourself with how it works. It's a little bit different, but fun. Cool. So, do you want to talk about the structure? Oh, sure. Yep. I'll switch it to you. Hi, yes, so I'm Enzo. I'm going to be talking just a little bit about the structure of um, basically what you're going to be working with here. So this assignment is based around arrays and structs. Um, so we can see here that uh, it's described very nicely in the overview. We have, um, what does it say? Assignment will test your ability to create, use and manipulate 2D arrays and structs. So if we look, let's actually get up the starter code and just have a quick look through it and see what's provided. And we'll come back here and use this to help guide how we read that code. So if we want the starter code, we can have a look through here. There'll be a command listed. Oh, here it is. Um, it guides you through how to make your own folder for it, which is really nice. You should probably do. Um, and you can also download it onto your own computer or more likely you're going to want to fetch it on uh, your VLAB on your CSE account. Now you copy and paste this command here. Same thing as the labs. Uh, be aware that see this little dot at the end here, that is part of the command. That's not just like a full stop end of sentence. You need that to copy things across. Uh, so let's do that. And then we can go over here and we can do, yeah, let's do yep. uh, uh, that one. There we go. Um, and then we're going to click enter and let's see if it's worked. If we go LS now, we have the starter code. Okay, let's open it up and have a look. So code, csfrogger, and inside we have some code. So it's pretty empty. There's not a lot going on here. Uh, you'll notice there's a header comment with some blanks. Remember to fill those in. Um, we've got some provided constants for you to use. We've got an enum and we have this struct here. Oh, there we go. Now, and then if we look down here, we have, what's this? We've got something called game board. So this is what the, if we go back to the overview, this is what the structure section over here is referring to. So we have your enum tile type, which is the type of each place on your map. And we have int occupied. And you'll notice that these two things here are stored inside our struct board tile. So we've got this 2D array and inside every spot inside that array is a struct. And each of those structs contains both a tile type and this integer variable, which can be true or false, one or zero. Um, and this is what we're going to use to sort of represent that same board that you saw earlier, the board um, when you saw in the game in Frogger. So I think we can just sort of have a look at what that looks like. Let's first check this. Yep. Um, yes, and we've got our board tile struct and we've got a 2D array of these, which is called game board. Okay. If we just scroll down a little bit, let's get up one of these beautiful diagrams here. So this is what your 2D array is going to look like 
uh, sort of uh, in a more abstract sense. But if you look at this diagram, you can interpret each one of these boxes as one of the structs. And then we've used the colors and the symbols inside there to help represent what that struct sort of is going to look like when you program it. Um, in this case, we have different types of tiles, which are represented by the different symbols and colors. And then we also have this special F symbol, which represents where your little frog is, if you remember from the game before. Okay. Is there anything else I should mention about the, the structure? Otherwise, we'll just start talking about the array. I think that's about it. Yep, awesome. So if you look at this, it does look like a lot in one place. It is like a bit of a confusing line. So let's try and break it down a little bit just to get you started. So we have a type. We've got a variable that's being created here called game board. And we can see that it is an array. It's got the square brackets. It's got two of them. It's also got struct board type array. So, uh, sorry, struct board tile. So what you read this as, what this is, is this is a variable, which is an array of arrays of structs. So this thing here is a 2D array, and then inside each thing is one of these structs. And that makes up our game board. We can sort of break this down and look at it a bit closer. If we look at game board itself, this is a 2D array. And what can we do with arrays? Well, with an array, we know that we can index it to access something inside it. So if we access, say, zero, well, what's inside our 2D array? It's another array. It's specifically one of these rows here. If we just go game board zero, we're gonna grab one of these rows like this. And now that row is an array. So what can we do with an array? We can index it again, which is gonna give us one specific element inside our 2D array. And in a way, these two numbers act like coordinates. You've got like the row coordinate and then the column coordinate. But once we've got this, we still can't just like set this equal to five or something because this is still a struct. Inside each element is a struct. So to access part of that and to start manipulating our board and set it, you need to use the dot operator, which we use to access a field inside a struct. And then we can use that to start you know, setting certain parts of this. So what did we say before? We said there were two parts inside our struct. There's the type, which is an enum tile type. So this can be any one of these values up here. And these enum values are going to represent these different types of tiles. Let's just set one of these randomly to um, lily pad. Got to change the field. Oh yes, very good point. This is the occupied field. So we can do type. And we could also set the occupied field of this to false to say the frog's not here yet. Uh, true. Okay. Gotta change the field on that as well. <sighs> You're so right. <laughs> I also need to change this. This is the problem with copying and pasting. Don't be like me. This is the occupied field. There we go. And now we've sort of set one of these elements to we've set the default values inside that spot. And we've set this one here. So this is zero, zero, which we can see we're accessing. We've correctly set this to a lily pad, which the frog is not on. Now- Gotta change that to false then. True is true. that the frog is there. True is that the frog is there. We need false here. Now, when you're starting out this assignment, we'll talk about this a little bit later when we get to the stages. One of the first things you're gonna do is go through this entire game board and set every single thing here to these starting values. Once you're done, your board should look like this, but except instead of uh, symbols and colors and the F character, you are using these two fields to represent those same things. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, now you might think if you were to do it this way, that's gonna take a long time. If we're gonna set every individual one of them manually, so you might have to have a think about like what other tools we use to repeat a process like that over and over again, so we can do this a little bit more efficiently. Now, just before I hand back to Gab, let's have a look at one more thing that's gonna be very useful to you and we will refer back to during this live stream, which is the reference implementation. So this assignment, similar to the last one, you know, we're asking you to complete a complex program. 
except this time we're actually providing you with a version of that program that you can run. You can't see the code for it, but you can actually run it and play around with it yourself and potentially play Frogger on it if you really want to. Uh, and you can use that reference implementation to figure out what you're supposed to do for a specific task. Everything is described in the spec, all the information you need is here, but if you need extra clarification, or you're confused about something, or you're struggling to understand the words and you want to see it visually, which very helpful, uh, I personally find that as a really nice way to learn, then you can use this ref uh, reference implementation to do that. So if we have a look through here, um, down, it's down, isn't it? Go back up. Oh. It's at the up there we go. Ah, amazing, yes. We can see this command here, 1511 CS Frogger. And if we run this, There we go. Um, so we haven't actually spoken about like how the program works yet. So I'm just going to run through this very quickly to show you. We've see we've got our board. We've got the actual thing that your program will produce, which is you know effectively the same thing as these diagrams here, just without the fancy colors. And we can you know you can use this reference implementation to test out the game and play it. So we can see, okay, well, stage one, we would, yep, set the board up. We can just try one of the things from stage two. Let's say, let's say you're up to stage two and you're looking at, oh, oh actually no, let's go stage yeah, one stage point. One, yeah. yeah. Let's say you're looking here and you want to test out adding a log. So we can read the command here. You can be like, I don't understand how this works exactly from the spec. I'm going to test it out myself. We go log and we say what row we want to put the log in. So let's put it in row five. Let's put it from zero to three. And then we can see how your application, your program is supposed to run once you've finished this stage. Amazing. Okay, a couple more things to talk about in the starter code. So we have provided you with, yes, creating the board. You are going to need to go through in the stages and complete uh, fill out the board, so initialize it. And you can see here that there are these to-dos to help guide you through those first few stages and show you where to put some of the code. These printf statements are sort of directly the output that we're expecting in the spec and in the auto tests. So like you can leave these there. These are the same ones that we'll have in our solution. Um, but you can sort of use this to guide you through the first few stages. There is one other thing that is provided here, which is this function down here, print board. Now this is a function that you can use to print out your your grid, your 2D array of structs, your game board. Um, to do that, you need to know how to call this function, but this is already done for you. In terms of like figuring out how to print it, you can just use this function instead of writing out the code yourself. Um, it would be very good to have a read through this code and try and figure out exactly how it works. So we'll cover it quickly, but we can see we've got a loop that's looping through every row and a loop that's looping through every column. So that's looping through every single struct in our 2D array. And then for each of those structs, if it's occupied, so if the occupied field is set to true, then we print out an F, which is why if we go back over here, we've got an F here, because that's where the occupied field is set to true. And then for everything else that doesn't have the occupied field set, it's gonna print out a different symbol based on the tile type. Now. The reason I say that this is important for you to understand because there are later stages where you might want to go and change this function. In fact, you will almost certainly want to modify this function. You won't need to for the first few stages though. So if you're you know, doing stage 1.1 and you something's not going right and you're like, okay, maybe the problem is in my print board, I'm going to try and fix that. That's probably not where the issue is. It's probably with what you're handing into print board. And then just in terms of actually calling print board, we'll cover this a little bit more next week with calling um, uh, functions with arrays, but, oh yes, oh, there we go. Perfect, it's already in here once. So if we look down here, you can see when you're passing an array into a function, you don't put any square brackets after it. Cause you can sort of think about, this is the name that corresponds to the array variable. Once you put square brackets after it, you're accessing that array and you know, accessing a subarray or accessing the struct inside it. So if you were to do like the common mistake we see is like size, size, you're actually trying to access a single struct now. So don't do that. Don't do what I just did. 
this is how you call that function. Amazing. Is there anything else I should add? No, Alright, I'll pass back to Gab. Oops. Perfect. Okay. So, yeah, so that's the starter code. Yours will look exactly like this. We've given you some um, little to-dos. I would recommend sort of going through them one at a time. We sort of tell you what to do. Initialize the game board. So that's what Enzo was doing before, where you call a game board, um, call a specific place, and then initialize the structs inside of it. Um, and then we sort of talk about which is what you would do for there we go, 1.2 and 1.3. And then for the rest of the stages, we leave it up to you. We're kind of just guiding you a little bit in stage one. Um, other thing to note is you need to make sure that when you're creating structs, just as like a general rule of thumb, we've given it to you as a hint as well. But sometimes people have a tendency to skip over hints. Remember to initialize every field inside of a struct when you initialize it. So make sure when you're doing things, you're initializing both. Um, also know that this is similar to the race car exercise in the labs from this week. So I would say make sure that you understand how that works first and then start trying to work on the assignment. Um, so there are also three stages, or there are four stages to the assignment, but there are three like main parts. So there's the setup mode, which is what we've got in the starter code for you, sort of like stepping you through that, which is setting up your game board, printing it out and starting to add components to it. Then you have a command mode. We'll go into it in a little bit more detail. So that starts from 1.2 onwards. Actually, that's supposed to be 1.3. Um, and that's where things start happening in a continuous loop. They will get covered a little bit more in lectures coming up, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Um, each command that you give to this loop will potentially have integers in it, but it will always start with a character. Um, different commands have different number of characters after them. So we saw up here that the L command has three integers after it, but a different command like C is just a letter by itself. Oh, sorry, C has one integer following it. And then we have game mode, which starts in stage four. So like, don't worry about it too much unless you get to stage four. If you think you're going to get to stage four, it might be a good idea to have a read through it um, because you might need to do some redesigning when you get to stage four, or you could try to plan early. Um, entirely up to you, um, but we will go through that in a second. Um, you can also assume that your program won't give you non-existent commands unless you're explicitly told otherwise. So don't worry about like, do I need to handle this error? If you need to handle that error, we will tell you. Um, make sure you follow all the steps in the getting started. Um, diagrams and pseudocode are also super useful, um, especially for this. I find it very difficult to visualize the board on its own. So having visual aids is really helpful. I would definitely recommend drawing some diagrams. Um, you'll come down here to the task section. You'll see that you've got stage one, two, three, four, and then a challenge exercise. Challenge is worth no marks, so I would say don't if you're interested, definitely have a look. It's all about building this assignment um, as an actual uh, playable game rather than something that we do in the terminal. Um, but it's worth no marks, so don't stress about that too much. You'll also note that the stages have different dots, same as the labs. So stage one and two, you'll see in the rationale up here that, yeah, we hope that all students are able to complete up to stage two. So that's why they're one dot. Their one dot is you know, a little bit easier than stage two. Stage two, a little bit more difficult, but still relatively doable. And then stage three and stage four, difficulty definitely increases and sort of less and less people will attempt that. So we hope that everyone can do up to stage two. So what is actually in these stages? So Enzo went over it a little bit briefly. Um, quick segue is that you'll also see how many marks each stage is worth. So you can sort of manage your time that way. Um, so in this stage, you'll initialize and set up the game board, add turtles to the game board, print it out, and add logs. So this is kind of going through what the starter code was. You'll see that you have um, the different types in the enums represented in these colors as well. So water, the bank, lily pad, turtle, and a log. Um, oh, not all of them are in this diagram, but we'll come to that later. There's also a key. So note that same as 2D rays, rows go across and columns go down. Also note that they start at zero and they start up here. It's like an Excel spreadsheet. Don't think of it like a normal like graph. Think of it like an Excel spreadsheet and you call the row first and then the column second. Um, drop boss, got over that. Um, there's also examples in these drop downs, same as assignment zero. So you'll see what this is supposed to look like on your board. And you can also run it on the um, reference spec as well. So something like this, we can run this and just identically, so anything that's in black is what you would run. And then control D for that. But that's what you see getting printed out. So that's a good way to test. 
Um, you can also auto test individual stages. So same as auto tests the assignment uh, for assignment zero and for labs as well. We give you the command relatively straightforward, chuck them in, but also do your own testing for stage one. We've given you quite a few tests, but we limit what we test as we get further through the assignment because we want to make sure that you understand and you can test some edge cases. So we're a little bit less helpful in our tests as we get to stage three and stage four. So we have this map looking at turtles. So now the key becomes relevant on what turtles actually are. Um, yeah, very important to note that the row comes first and the column comes second. So in this case, we have a turtle in two, one. So row two, position one. So that's here. And then two, eight. So over here, four, three. So row four coming across three and then six, one. So that's always helpful to look back on if you're a little bit confused about what comes first or, or a column, like why doesn't my diagram look right? Um, that's a good place to have a look. Um, yeah, you can also place no turtles, which was the example above. Um, there are clarifications as well. If you've got questions about specific things, I would say have a look at the clarifications and then have a search on the forum and then ask us. Um, and there are some more examples with a little bit more. They cover invalid cases. And again, another test. Um, down here we get to the command loop, which is where we scan in or continuously continuously scan in commands until the game is either won, lost, or control D is pressed. You don't have to worry about winning or losing until stage three. This is just kind of like a heads up that it does exist, but all you need to worry about at the moment is when a user pr presses control D, how you deal with that. So we have some hints here on um, how scanf works. So remembering that it is an int function. So when you scan, when you use scanf, scanf will also return you an integer and you can use that value to test if something was scanned in successfully. So if you successfully scan something in, you'll get a one return. If you scan in two things successfully, you get two and so on. If you, if control D is entered, that's an unsuccessful scan. So you don't get um, the integer that you're expecting. Also note that when you're scanning in the layout of this is kind of bad. We'll go back and change this. But note that that's got a, actually I'll just type it up. What that looks like is, um, we're saying that when you're scanning in characters, you should have seen this in the other assignment as well, but make sure that you put a space in front of your percent C, and then you can put that into whatever it is you're putting it into. Yeah. You know what I mean? But basically do know that there's a space there. We'll fix the formatting of that um, later. But yeah, make sure you have the space in front. If you're having some issues, please go and check that. It's in danger for a reason. A lot of people will skip it. Please make sure that you read that when you chuck it in. Cool. Then we get to the log command, which Enzo was talking about before. And there's some information there. Um, talks about edge cases, talks about things that you're like, hmm, how would it work like that? You've also got some examples that have a few more, um, a few more things inside of them. Um, then we get down to testing and submission. For each stage, you can auto test it as a whole stage. You don't need to go through and auto test each like subsection of the stage. If you don't want to, you can write it all and then test it at the end. We wouldn't recommend that though. We recommend auto testing each substage. But then when you get to the end, running all of these and using the give command, please give as often as you can. We save backups of all of your versions of code. So if you have um, stage one up and running, it's perfect and you submit it and then you get to stage two and you're like, hmm, what if I try this and all of your code just falls apart? That's fine because we have a version that worked and you can collect that from the server and you can start going on that again. So give as frequently as, as you want, like, I don't know, sort of when you finish working and you're sort of taking a break, I would say use the give command if it's working. And even if it's not, it's just like a progress saver because we back up your files. Cool. So that's stage one. Stage two, kind of similar, still doing a little like board manipulation. So a um, little bit more difficult. So now we are clearing rows off the board, deleting logs and starting to move the frog. So we have a clear row command. So what that does is you'll see in these examples, but you can have, um, you can have turtles, you can have logs. And when you clear a row, they all disappear and go back to water. So that's what that's doing. Then we have deleting a log. So it's very similar to clearing a row. So kind of just a hint there and it's got some similar things in its specification, but clearing a log is a little bit different in that you just give it a coordinate that falls on the log. So like four, two, so zero, one, two, three, four, and then position two, uh, wait, different one. I'm lying. This one, this is the one that I want. So remove four, three. So row zero, one, two, three, four, and then the coordinate zero, one, two, three. So there that falls on the log. So it removes the whole log and we see that that's gone down here. 
um, a lot more in the spec. I would say have a look at all of these examples to fully, fully understand it, um, and also test on the reference implementation. So if we wanted to do test removing a log, um, we can add a log. Oops, let's run that again. So uh, let's go. We can add a log. And then we want to actually get rid of that log, we can do that. So we can go three, um, let's go three, five. And we can see that that disappears. Perfect, that's pretty similar. Or, you know, set does, does what it needs to do, a um, little bit similar to the example that we give you. So definitely play around with the reference implementation for some edge cases there. Then we get to moving Frogger, which does take a little bit longer, um, takes a little bit to sort of work out how you're going to do this. I would say, like, draw some diagrams, have a think about what it means to move in each direction. Um, know that the directions are like how you move when you're in a game, so like WASD and exactly the same direction, just because that's quicker than having like up be U and then D is like all the way over the other side of the keyboard. So it just sort of keeps them together and similar gaming setup. So W moves you up, S moves you down, A to the left, D to the right. <laughs> I can't tell my left from my right, so I don't know if you can tell. Um, yeah, and this is where the occupied status of Frogger comes into play because you only want to see one Frogger on the board. So if you're seeing multiple Froggers, that's a good indication that your moving function isn't working correctly or your moving implementation isn't working correctly. Um, also read the notes as well. We see some edge case movement. So Frogger can never like go off the board. Frogger is bound inside and we see some examples there. These ones are really long, but definitely have a look through them. And again, testing and submission and quickly go over stage three and stage four. So stage three is a little bit more complex. You have to do a little bit of design work. So in the starter code, we've given you a starting struct and we've given you the game board for stage three. You might need to change some things. You might need to add some things in, um, sort of a great way to demonstrate what you know and how much you understand about it. Um, so three lives is kind of like the normal Frogger game where you can have three attempts at trying to get to the lily pads. And if you can't get it, then you lose. So we have examples of both of those and some fun messages that get printed out. Um, then we have adding bugs. This is where your design um, capabilities really come in. Obviously if, you're, um, obviously, if you're struggling with it a little bit, you can ask us, post on the forum, that sort of thing, but really good to play around and see how well you understand all the structures that we've given you. Um, yeah, so you add bugs to the board and they become an enemy for Frogger, so another way for a frog to lose a life as you can see there, the frog moves from there to there, jumps on top of the bug and loses a life. And then we start moving the bugs. This stage or this part of the stage is a little bit, little bit complex. There's a lot of information in the spec. I would say definitely play around with the reference implementation as well, because we haven't been super thorough with the examples that we've given you. So I would say, if you're like, hmm, what would happen if I did this? Definitely try it out in the reference because there's a lot of, a lot of little things that you have to think about to do this but a diagram that talks about the order in which bugs move. So because you have a lot of bugs and because a lot of them are moving, you wanna make sure that you only move each bug once. So we have um, an order in how they move. So you go like across the rows and then down and sort of keep going along. And that's the order that you move them. This will make more sense when you get to that part of the assignment. Um, yeah, and some clarifications on when bugs move is also really important. And then onto stage four. Stage four, a little bit more difficult, and this is where we get into the game mode. So we have our setup mode where we can, where we set up the board and then we have our command mode where we're like editing the board, adding logs, removing them, clearing roads, that sort of thing. We're doing like a lot of, we can do a lot of different things basically and make the board really work for us. Then we get to stage four and stage four is about sort of closing out what a user can do. And now you can only move Frogger. Like you're done with the setup, you've set up the board, it looks great. Now it's time to see if your frog can actually make it to these lily pads. Um, when you're in game mode, the board also starts moving. So the rows alternate which direction they move. And there's some, uh, some comments about how Frogger and bugs will react to this. Bit of a read, definitely worth it. Um, play around with the spec as well. That's probably the best way. And then we've also got all of these um, examples as well. Um, there's also another bug, which is the super bug, a little bit more difficult. Um, would have a look at, if you're planning on doing all of stage four, I would say um, have a look at that when you're implementing bugs in stage three, it might make your life a little bit easier. 
um, yeah, more clarifications and testing and submission. And I'll pass back over to Enzo to talk about the assignment scheme. Just to clarify, when we say implement bugs, we mean the enemy type bugs. Do not intentionally write bugs into your code. <laughs> or not. You, you understand. Good. Okay. So let's actually um, go back a little bit and look up the top here at the stages. You might have noticed that there is a little bit of familiar images that you've seen before. So we have one dot, one dot, two dot, three dots. So you've seen these from the labs. They have slightly different meaning here, but it's pretty much the same thing where we expect, you know, one dots are um, what we consider to be really important information that we want you to take away from this. This is really important to learn. Two dots gets a bit more advanced and then three dots uh, is the sort of more complex side or exploring the, the topic much deeper. Unlike the labs, you do need to complete all of the dotted stages to get full performance marks for this assignment. It's not like the labs where we have like uh, one dot and two dot are marks and then three dots are bonus marks. It is all of these stages. So just be aware of that slight difference. Now, the skull stage is still completely optional worth no marks, just like in the labs. And we can actually see this reflected if we go down into the marking scheme, all the way at the bottom here, all the way down, we can see that, um, yes, to get 100% for performance, you do need to complete stages one, two, three, and four. That being said, the marks are actually more heavily weighted towards the earlier stages. So it's not like each stage is worth 25%. You'll notice here that if you were to complete stages one and two, fully implementing um, all of their uh, capabilities and passing all the auto marking text, tests, you can expect to achieve about a credit for your performance mark. And then on top of that, you know, you can get all of the style marks, even with only completing stages one and two, and get quite a good mark overall for the assignment. So just be aware of that. Uh, the later stages are definitely still worth, worth marks, but as a pure percentage, they are worth a smaller pro uh, portion of those marks. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the other parts. So we have the performance marks, which like lab exercises are based on, we give you specific auto tests that you can run. And then once you submit after the due date, we run our own different tests on the solution, on your uh, assignment solutions. And based on those marks, you get, uh, ooh, the chat disconnected for a sec there. Um, you get a portion of the performance marks. Then on top of that, so the uh, performance marks take up 80% of the total mark. And then on top of that, you have 10% from auto style marking. So we run your code through our one fun one, one style tool um, or you know some automated style checker. And then based on uh, the output of that, you get an automatic mark. So that is, uh, checking things like your syntax, uh, like your white space usage, sorry, and like uh, more basic things, indentation, um, variable naming, uh, more of the pedantic little things that we got you to focus on in assignment zero. So the things that were in the assignment zero, a lot of the things in the assignment zero marking scheme, they're gonna be automatically marked here. And then what we're gonna be doing is you've got this other 10% of the style mark, which comes from your tutors manually going through and having a more holistic look at your assignment style. So there we're gonna be looking at things like how well you have broken up your code into functions and how well you've made use of the tools we've taught you like loops and if statements to make your code clean and readable and also to reduce repetition. Um, so you might look back at some of these stages and you might notice that like, uh, as Gab mentioned earlier, there's some you know very similar sections. So if you can find like, I think in this start of stage three or stage two, it's stage two, isn't it? Um, if you can find a way of avoiding repeating the code more than one time, or you know, if you've got two bits of code that are either identical or almost identical with just a little bit different, you might wanna figure out how you can use the same block of code for both of those sections. Uh, and tools like functions, tools like using loops uh, cleverly can really help a lot with that. The other things we'll be checking out is just um, how readable your code is. So we want your code to be self-explanatory is sort of our, our golden rule. Uh, if you have like, a condition that's really confusing, uh, it's full of numbers, full of a hundred different things, you wanna find a way of making that easier for us to understand. Um, 
Yes, and I think that's what it says here as well. Yeah, clarity, readability, use of functions, efficient loop, use of loops and if statements. Uh, I do believe that eventually we'll be, we will be posting a more detailed specification of what we mean here by uh, what's going to be checked here in the manual marking, but that is not in the spec right now. Um, okay, in terms of other admin stuff, actually, there's one thing I wanted to cover quickly. Uh, it's right if I just quickly talk about the auto tests, because um, yeah. you've seen them. They're the same auto tests as you use in the lab, but just to make sure you're familiar with them, and because auto tests can be confusing, uh, I'm going to run them. Now, they're not going to uh, be successful because we haven't implemented anything here. We're just using the starter code. But a really important tool, so we've, we've told you reference implementation is super helpful for this assignment. Uh, running auto tests to check your progress is really helpful. To do that, you do want to make sure you are looking at the auto tests and when they succeed, that's great. When they fail, have a close look at what they print out and try and use that information. Do a later stage probably, where you've got like more auto tests. Okay, I might just do the early stage because because uh, the board won't even print out. So like, oh, we'll see. We'll try, if, if this doesn't show well, we'll do a later one instead. Um, uh, there we go. Nope. Uh, there we go. Okay, so we run the auto tests. Um, you'll see a bunch of, you'll potentially see a bunch of error messages. Um, so you can use this. You'll notice that in these error messages, it sort of points out where an error has occurred. It tries to tell you what's happened in the error. Some of this can be very confusing, um, but when you get an error like this, a very good thing to do is run your code manually and see if you get the same error. And if it's a more complicated test, you'll actually notice down the bottom, it does show all the commands that were implemented. So yeah, let's, you're right. Let's write, run a slightly more complicated one. Let's go to stage two. Um, let's do this auto test here. Uh, oof. Uh, there we go. You know, oh, let's have a look. Something goes wrong. I'm just gonna cut this off early. So let's do control C to, cancel it, then we can scroll up and like look at the first one we failed and we can say, oh, you know, what's going on here? If your program doesn't crash and it produces output, it'll show the difference between your output and the expected output. And you can hunt through that to try and figure out what's wrong. Or what you can do is you can take these commands down here, run them through yours one by one, and then run them through the reference implementation to see what we should have done here. So like if I wanted to, I could, you know, grab this here um, I'm just going to post them here for now. Yep. And we could just, oh, we could just say, okay, uh, my program's not doing this, right? Let's run the reference implementation. 1511 CS Frogger. And then let's run these one by one. So we have zero and then we have log, log three, five, six, three, five, six. Oh, and a log appears there. And when I run my own solution, something else happens. So I can see what's going wrong there. If you use that as you go to like help you figure out what's wrong, uh, it can help quite a lot. Let's get rid of this now. Okay, in terms of other admin things, um, let's see, what else have I said here? Um, okay, so a couple more things just down the bottom here. Um, be aware that this is an individual assignment. Um, you know, don't plagiarize, don't work with one of your friends. Uh, we expect you to be writing all the code and for you to be the only person who's really ever seeing the code. The exception to that is you can ask us, your tutors, to have a look, help you out, uh, you know, maybe help you find or help guide you towards fixing a particular bug. Uh, and in that sense, we should quickly talk about where you can go to get help from tutors. So. I mean, the first place, the easiest place is the forums. If we go to the, actually I might not go to the forums right now, but if you go to the forums, there'll be an assignment one channel. You can ask questions there. Before you ask, we will say, go and search for other people's questions first. Cause if you're struggling with it, almost certainly someone else has gotten stuck on it. So you can see if they've already had their question answered and you can use their answer to help you. Um, and if you can't find anyone else who's posted about it, post about it yourself, because there's probably other students who are also stuck there and are just waiting for someone else to make the post. Um, if you need more help, you can ask in your labs, you can ask your tutors for help, you can ask general questions um, to your tutors 
you know, during the tutorial as well, potentially, if they're happy to answer them. And then finally, we will have help sessions running pretty constantly that you can go and get help with fixing up parts of your assignment or helping guide you through specific sections. But yes, aside from tutors, aside from course staff members, uh, no one else should really be seeing your assignment code. Cool. Uh, then in terms of due date, if we scroll down to the bottom here, we will see that it is due on the 24th of October. So that is Monday week, seven. Monday week seven. Thank you. And we have the uh, late penalty here. So if you don't hand it in Monday week seven, uh, one of these will apply to you, whether it's one day late. So the moment you tick over that due date, you'll have a percent taken off the cap off your maximum mark, three days, percent increases, five days, the percent increases, so on. Um, yes. I think that's pretty much all I wanted to cover here. Um, I guess we could talk, do we want to just talk about general tips and advice now? Yep. Sounds good. Yep. Oh. So, oh. <laughs> you alright? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, also, just like a note for the assignment, you shouldn't need to Google anything. Like you can Google things to like check your understanding for certain things, hmm. but everything that you need to complete this assignment, you will be taught. Like it's not as though we're like, go and research how to do this. You will have been taught how to use everything. Um, yeah, when in doubt, ask your tutors. They can usually explain if you're like, hmm, I found this thing online that I think might be better. Like maybe just talk to them and get them to explain it just in case. But you can complete this assignment entirely with things that you've learned in this course. Yeah. Yes, and things that you've learned up to uh, this week, I think. I this think week and next week, maybe. Yeah. You yeah. should have everything by next week that you need to do it. Um, in terms of other general advice, probably get started early is the big one. The sooner you get started on it, the happier you will be. Because uh, it just takes a while to like process, and sometimes you get stuck on a stage. You, like, you can do it, you just can't think of it immediately, and you need to dwell on it and like, for a walk, have a shower, let it process in your brain, um, and then it might come to you and you can sort of implement it. Uh, but the earlier you start, the more chance you've got to think about it, the more chance you've got to like spend time fixing things up, reworking things. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, other thing, also make sure that you auto test often and like as frequently as you want. Like I said before, you can back things up. So like there is no, like there's no worry in, have I submitted it too many times? The answer is no, you can submit as many times as you want until something breaks, but I doubt that you'll get that far. So as often as you can. Yeah. And as you're going, have a think about functions, have a think about your style. You don't need to write everything into perfect functions as you go, but keep it in mind, keep your style in mind. So you don't get to the end, you've written like a gigantic program all in main and you're spending the last 24 hours just like, rapidly trying to fix all everything up. That can be very stressful. Oh, and the other thing about starting early is towards the due date, uh, things like help sessions get very packed because everyone's sort of rushing to get everything done. The earlier you start, the more sort of like uh, available those sorts of uh, help things for you are gonna be. So the easier it's gonna be for you to ask for help. Yeah, and the forum gets very busy before the assignment's due as well. Yeah. Um, I think that was... Um, oh, cool. That was just Sasha. Ah, uh, yes. Um, yeah, I think that was pretty much everything. Make sure that you do understand functions. Like, if you don't understand functions, that's fine, but please use your lab time wisely. Go to help sessions. Please make sure that you understand them. Um, they're the best thing. So please make sure that you understand them. Your tutors understand them. They can explain it to you. Like, don't be like, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't want to ask. Like, please ask. Please, we want to make sure that you understand because it will make your life so much easier. Awesome. In the remaining time, are there any just like general questions people want to ask us about any of the, the specification or the starter code? Is there anything you want us to cover in more depth? Something I can see being a little bit confusing is like, these are the enums that you put into your struct into each tile. Um, but these are not actually the characters that are getting printed out. If you look at the print function, you'll notice that if it's one of these enums, then the char we store a chart here and then that's the thing that gets printed out. If there's any things like that that you're looking through right now and you're not sure about, feel free to ask us. Aside from that, I guess we can... <laughs> Is anyone still watching? Actually, there's a bit of a delay between. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hmm. What other advice can we provide? Uh, assignments like this are, are quite a bit harder until you like finally get something. I shouldn't say harder, but they can be a lot more intimidating until you finally get something like visibly showing on the screen. So we provided the print function for you. Once you get through just like the first stage, um, which isn't too much to do, you've got to initialize your array, you've got to put some turtles into it. But like even once you've just figured out how to initialize everything in the array, and as you said earlier, initialize every part of every struct in the array, you'll be able to start printing it out by just calling your print function here. And that can be really, really helpful to just like help you debug. If something's going wrong and you can't see what's going on, it doesn't make sense. Just stick a few of these throughout your code and just like have a look at what's happening to your board over time. Once you can visualize what's going on in your code, it becomes much less intimidating. I think it's fair to say. Yeah, 100%. Mm. Um, also, um, in terms of like how long this is probably gonna take you in comparison to assignment zero, it's probably gonna take you like 10 times as long. Longer. <laughs> like probably longer, like that's not an exaggeration. Like it's gonna take you significantly longer because there's a lot more in it and depending on how you write your code to start with is gonna depend how long it's going to be. Yeah. So. Obviously that depends on like how well you, like how you found assignment zero and whether you get stuck on things. Cause like, uh, you know, assignment zero is something you were writing a lot of you as you uh, developed your programming skills. So some things you would have done early on that you had to go back and fix and that might've taken a lot of time. But in general, this assignment is a lot larger in scope. And so definitely all the more reason to start it early. Don't expect it to take, to be as much code as assignment zero was. Um, and that is re reflected in how much it is worth. This assignment here is worth, uh, I believe it's 15%. I'm going to scroll down just to make sure I don't say anything wrong. Uh, but, uh, yeah, 15% yeah, of your final mark, whereas assignment zero was worth 5%. So take that into account when considering like, uh, how you plan out your resources and how you spend your time. Awesome. Cool. I think that's, I think that's everything. Um, yeah, obviously if you've got any questions, chuck them on the forum or Please go do. to your lab. Thank you so much for listening. Um, yeah, good luck with your assignments, I guess. Have fun, have fun playing the game, whether it be <laughs> the actual game or the reference implementation. Uh, I'm probably going to be doing that after this. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, I don't know how it turns off. <laughs> well, we can... Is, it, Is there 10... That? That, that's going to mute it. Because there's 10 minutes left tech. Did we say it was 12.30 to 1.30? I think it was 12.30 to whenever. Oh, okay. So, I think... We don't just want to play Hopper in the... <laughs> Frogger in the meantime. I'm going to play one little game of uh, Frogger and then we'll log off and stuff. It's not as fun without the sounds. No, it's not. Also, yeah, this is not going to be identical to the one that you produce. Uh, in particular, you once the frog gets to the end, that's game over. Or like that's your one. You don't need to do multiple frogs in your version. Yeah. Oh yes. By the way, uh, if you're not sure about how Frogger works, you can definitely Google it. This is a very old game. Oh, I'm bad at it. Um, all right. Well, let's just. All right. All right. I reckon it might be. Yeah, I reckon we'll stop there. Let's see.